Entry 1. The delegation will meet for the first time today. I'm keeping this record as ordered, though. I don't see the point. The humans aren't exactly reclusive, but the hoops they made themselves jump through before they even returned our first contact message were absurd. I heard second-hand that they nearly went into a civil war over the possibility of a message being bait for some sort of trap. Are they just naturally paranoid? Or have they run into some other species of non-humans that gave them trouble? I rather suspect the former. Their military for just having one star system is pretty numerous. Entry 2 The humans set up some civilian diplomat instead of a military leader. I was surprised. They seem to value martial prowess fairly highly, so why do they have a civilian leader? Apparently this guy was selected after a brief voting period, which wasn't made open to the general population, but was only open to national leaders. That's troubling. National leaders in a spacefaring species? That can only mean delays in the future. Entry 3 A few more diplomats came up today with huge stacks of portable computers. Our translators already added the one language they have used so far to the universal system, so we didn't have any trouble deciphering the data from the computers. Apparently they want to know as much as possible about us, and in exchange they provided a bunch of information about themselves, their history, some more language dialects we didn't have covered yet, and some of their own star maps. I was stunned. Why are they being so trusting? They were on the verge of a civil war when we contacted them. No. It was because we contacted them. Entry 4 I know it's been several weeks since I last updated this thing, but the human's data is taking up all of my time. Apparently they have been in a state of what we would consider constant civil war, since their people evolved far enough to grasp fire. Over the dumbest things too, from religion to territory. Nearly a fifth of all their most important technology, including their relativistic drive technology was derived from something designed to kill other humans. No wonder they're being so open. Our people wouldn't engage in an internal war on the scale these humans have ever. They've killed more of themselves in the last thousand years than my people have ever died. Total. Entry 5. The ninth week of the contract meeting is ending now. The reactions from the humans on their worlds have been more interesting than all the data they gave us. By now they're starting to get back to routine. They have their own planet, another planet, and about five moons in their system colonised to some degree, and each has a distinct culture and way of life. The reaction on each when we made contact was the same. They flipped out, and their peoples were seized by everything ranging from panic to joy. But now? Their reactions have stabilised to the extent that I don't think we're going to get a reaction out of them unless we create some further provocation. The most read news articles on their electronic communications networks are more about domestic problems and entertainment and their economies than they are about us. Are humans just more comfortable in routines or are they frustrated with our lack of diplomatic progress? I'm confused. The humans I've met seem unconcerned but I know the ambassador from our people is getting worried. Entry 6. I'm relieved. The human ambassador met me personally, today, informally, here on the ship. He said that he could tell that I was getting worried about the negotiations, and he wanted to address me personally. I asked how he could tell I was worried, when he had only met our species for the first time less than 100 solar cycles ago, and he replied that it was all part of being a diplomat. I stated outright that I was confused by the seemingly lack of disruption on the part of the people below. He said that there were plenty of people who were disrupted, but that most of the humans in the system had already decided to wait and see what the outcome of the negotiations were before doing anything. After all, he said, even if my species becomes an active member of the galactic community, most humans will stay right here living their lives, will be affected by galactic politics, new technology and colonization, even assuming that we could find new Earth-type worlds out there, but most will want to stay right where they are. I asked him how he could say that when so many of his people had colonised the rest of the system, and he laughed, I think. It's completely different when you can see Earth out of your window. Entry 7 
Things have picked up so much. We got our translators working, to the effect that nuance of speech, not just content, can be translated appropriately. The human ambassador's speech and conversation were suddenly so much clearer. To his credit, he told us that he had been refraining from common speech, slang, and aphorism as much as possible. I wouldn't want to use a saying or phrase that had a clear meaning to another human but made no sense, or worse, insulted one of your people. Now I can speak freely. I have to wonder if this faster-paced dialogue will negatively affect the negotiations. The ambassador broached the toughest topic today. Faster than light travel. Entry 8 Generally, species are content to create FTL on their own, before they even contact us or vice versa. Humans are the exception. They colonise their entire star system with seven inhabited bodies, and over a thousand mined, explored, probed, or mapped bodies with no habitation in their systems. So much of their population lives in their orbital platforms that their own homeworld barely even supports two-thirds of their species. They did this without FTL. Clearly the fact that they have reacted peacefully to our presence, rather than precipitously fighting or ignoring us, indicates that they are mature enough to handle faster than light travel. But I am privately concerned. One of the human diplomats has already begun copying our speech and movement patterns. I found myself opening up to him without even realising it until afterwards. He must be doing it on purpose to set us at ease. After 120 of their days, they're copying the behaviour of their first alien contact. This is one of their finest diplomatic minds of course, but still. If they can do it with behaviour, can they do it with technology? I suspect they will ask for a working FTL drive to study in their next meeting. Entry 9 I am vindicated, it seems. I spoke my concerns to the ambassador today, and he agreed that there will be no gifting of FTL technology to the humans, that they would have to earn it on their own. The humans would react poorly, I guess, but tactfully, as at least a few of them seem to genuinely care what we think. I was right, naturally. The human ambassador asked that their people be given a working FTL drive to reverse engineer in exchange for an unspecified piece of technology of theirs. Their technology, the ambassador replied quickly, was inferior to ours in every way save communications, and we had no need for their communications technology. Communicating faster than light is something we can do already. Communicating instantaneously anywhere in their system, as they do, is a wondrous piece of technology, but not necessary for our people. The human ambassador reacted with shock and surprise immediately, and then quickly became suspicious. I think he may have gleaned that we had discussed this amongst ourselves. How, I cannot guess. We spoke of other things, and the ambassador of the human seemed mollified by the discussions that followed. Will he broach it again? Probably. Entry 10. The human surprise us. It is exactly half of one year after first contact, and life, as I before noted, continues. They are fully one third finished with another of their orbital habitation platforms, and we were given a tour of the construction site. Huge robotic construction devices smelt down chunks of ore from the many, many asteroid and lunar mining platforms the humans have throughout their system. Ferried to them by relativistic drive powered ore haulers, the slag is then fed into their forges and reduced to elemental purity, and refined ore is then crafted, still in space, into modules which are then attached to the frame of the space installation. The elemental slag is mostly hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and silicon in this system. They use these things to make air and computers, apparently, which are then used in the construction of their platforms. I am outstanding. They have created the most efficient industrial complex we have ever seen, by necessity. They lack FTL, so in the absence of easily reachable resource deposits, that they can mine on their colonies. They simply process asteroids into something useful. Another reason to deprive them of FTL? If they can prosper in such paucity, how will they react to plenty? Entry 11. Disaster. One of the probes that the humans used to drag the ores they extract from their asteroid belts slammed into our ship today. Our force was held, but the drone was wrecked beyond repair, and the asteroid deflected towards Earth. It now moves only a few times faster than the speed of sound, 
leisurely by space travel standards, but it is colossal. It will depopulate the part of the planet it hits, surely. I am told that the probes and ore haulers use a computer guidance system to slip into Earth orbital slots with their payloads, where the ores are removed by the pace and need that the human construction schedule dictates. If we had not been in the path of these probes, this would have never happened. The humans provided us with a copy of the ore haulers' schedules to avoid just such a calamity. How did this happen? What will happen to Earth? Entry 12 We have come to a conclusion. The crew and diplomatic staff had decided that we will divert the asteroid into the Earth's sun, using our own ship to provide the stopping mechanism. Our fields are not recharged, the impact will kill us. We are not committing lightly. Fully half the crew said that we should abandon the humans to their fate and continue on negotiating. Some of the rest said that we should do all that we can without destroying ourselves, but I and the ambassador disagree. We did this. Our misgivings about their technological level aside, the humans should not be driven to near extinction by their own first contact. Entry 12. Addendum. Bizarrely enough, all is well. The asteroid nearly hit the planet when the humans took matters into their own hands. We had manoeuvred our ship into the path of the asteroid, ready to deflect the massive thing with our own ship if need be. We did this, this was our fault. Except the human diplomats were frantic, demanding that we move the ship at once. We were baffled. We were offering to solve the problem we had caused, so why were the humans demanding that we did not? They beseeched us to move, to let the asteroid move along its own path directly towards the planet, saying that we did not deserve to suffer, to bear the brunt of this calamity. Finally we gave in and moved out of the course of the asteroid. We were watching what we thought would be the end of the Earth below, but we were wrong. A blast appeared near the asteroid and we realised what was happening. The humans had detonated a nuclear device in the asteroid's path to divert it. Not destroy it, but divert it. A few dozen of their own drone craft slammed into the side of the asteroid, which had just been hit by the bomb, propelling it into near-Earth orbit. The human ambassador actually took me aside and explained that they had a contingency set aside for just such a catastrophe, dating back to when they had first created the mining drone and ore hauler network. He told me that the technology they had first employed to create the interplanetary ore haulers had originally been far more primitive and unable to precisely calculate the appropriate course and speed to get the asteroid safely back to Earth. The asteroid division weapons and drones had been created to reduce any risk. In total shock, I asked why they had done this, and almost as importantly, why they had been willing to risk such a mining venture if they knew such a potential problem existed. Necessity is the mother of invention he replied. Entry 13. 50 days have passed since the asteroid incident, and the human's reaction has been alarming. Civilian populations and not a few military across the system are clamouring for attention, some demanding that the human diplomats apologise for what they have done, as if the humans caused this. Others demanding that we suffer for this transgression, others yet launching into wild speculation. Above it all, the human ambassador has changed the tack of these negotiations completely. Now all he seems to ask about is the justice systems of the galaxy, where before he has inquired about everything from laws restricting invasive plant species in agriculture, to FDL drives to the origins of our linguistic colloquialisms. When asked what his official stance about the asteroid incident will be, by other members of his own species who are not part of his delegation, he replies cryptically, patience is a virtue. Never close doors you cannot open. Invite no conflict where none exists. Yellow is most flavourful. I have no idea what the last one means. Perhaps our translators are not as capable of translating euphemisms as we thought. Regarding the possession of the nuclear devices they employed to divert the asteroid, he has hastened, quite uninvited, to assure us that it had been over a century and a half since any nuclear device was used in war. This assuages my fears somewhat, especially since we discreetly scanned the complex on the planet's surface that launched the nuke, and found that even the most powerful of these devices is little more than six times the effective power of the ones they employed. Strong enough to damage our field, surely, but nowhere near enough to destroy us outright. But I should not be thinking of these potential new friends as potential new enemies, as he himself says. Entry 14. 
Again, I am amazed by the human's ability to ignore trouble. It is now 250 days after first contact, and the human media has actually greatly reduced their mention of us and the asteroid incident. They are now beginning to return to what I am told, with vast disgust, interestingly, by the human ambassador, is the norm for their media. Music, banal daily news, and what I think may be some form of medical treatment aimed at those who suffer reproductive isolation. The fact that, in less than a year, the human species has been exposed to alien life and nearly been wiped out by the carelessness of said life seems to have been absorbed by the population with a genuinely amazing degree of blasé acceptance. I understand we will be going on a tour of Earth itself, tomorrow though in four bodysuits naturally. We will have to be. Their atmosphere is breathable of course, but their sun is so much more radioactive than ours in the spectra of ultraviolet and radio that to not wear suits would be downright stupid. Entry 15 What in the world are these humans doing without their own FTL drives? I returned from a 10 day tour of their homeworld today and I can say with certainty that I have never been more unnerved. These humans possess, I knew, massive space stations, tightly packed with their own, and their non-Earth colonies were barely at the level where abundant food could be harvested. I had made, naturally, the same assumption that the Ambassador did when we saw these places, that these were criminals being made to suffer, or volunteers who chose to live in these awful conditions because they literally had no choice, or the infirm and weak who could be sheltered in a completely artificial environment because their home world was too harsh for them in some way. What I discovered is that Earth is, if anything, nearly as badly overpopulated in its capitals and trade hubs as it is in their colonies and space stations. I saw towers of apartments, some with over 2,000 people living in them, stacked so close together they looked like rows of molecules in a crystal. And the people there seemed as if this was the norm. The leaders and visionaries and great speakers of humanity spoke and fetid and recited prepared lines, but I heard none of it. These people are not a people in true squalor, not really, certainly not by their own standards, but I hear tell of truly shocking slums in the cities of the poorest continents. There seems a disparity of wealth and power exists here, and I am unearthed, deeply. A population this large achieving the great works of their peoples like the ore haulers and orbital platforms, is not impossible, but only a tiny fraction of their people are wealthy enough to have done it. A small percentage without FTL. Entry 16 I suppose the entry before this must seem quite hysterical. It was not the numbers alone which disturbed me and the others of the delegation. The human ambassador once told me that necessity is the mother of innovation. These people need a means of controlling their population so badly that the first thing some of us did when we returned to privacy was propose that they be given a working FTL drive and the coordinates of a world they could inhabit and we could not. Of course the ambassador rejected that foolishness. I approve. What unnerved me so deeply was that the humans seemed to be capable of surviving so much that we could not. I do not of course speak of solar radiation. A little extra stellar radiation could be compensated. These, however, are a warlike people. That was my impression when first we met and my opinion has not wavered. Yet, they coexist in tight groups in most of their population centres. Their colonies were made of a mix of people that their nature states they could not tolerate. And their culture overcomes fractitious divides so fast, we nearly kill them off, and then, not 60 days after the event, those who continue to demand that we suffer retribution are labelled openly by their leaders as deluded. If these people had developed FTL drives on their own, we would have met them on the edges of our own territory, I'm sure. We would have met as friends, but we would have met as equals when we are currently not. I should not be so disturbed by that thought, yet I am. Entry 17 270 days gone by. The human ambassador has become more and more reluctant to diverge information about his own people to us, even as he shows us around his homeworld and pours more and more data about his species into our computers for our analysts to devour. He answers every question we ask him, yet he divulges less and less in the way of specifics. Oddly enough, he actually seems far more relaxed in our presence than he was when we met. He showed up in a completely different set of clothing than the type he usually wears today, 
lacking the odd cloth around his neck. I wonder why. Entry 18. We return to Earth today and I am far more impressed this time than I let myself be last time. The human ambassador this time took us to what seems to be a site of great importance to his people. A building in one of their largest cities called the UN Headquarters. The building, I mean, not the city. We spoke to a panel of 200 human ambassadors, each representing a human nation or extraplanetary colony. We answered questions and had our images captured by their media through a very thick looking defensive device. When I asked why we were being defended, the human ambassador's aide told me that it was for our own protection from those humans who did not appreciate our presence here as much as they should. I was touched by this though, apparently this is not at all unusual. We spoke to many of these diplomats and I came away with the feeling that many have wanted to ask far more questions than they had been able to, out of a sense of propriety. Our own ambassador told me that he thought it was to prevent any sort of insult, but I was not sure. Some of the human ambassadors seemed outright angry at our presence, and several were apparently restrained from outbursts only by their peers' angry gestures. I think it has something to do with the nearly groveling request the human chief ambassador gave to us on the very first day. Not to even decrypt, let alone translate, a single one of the millions of messages sent to our ship, directly or otherwise, that did not bear his signature. Entry 19. 300 solar days have passed since the humans replied to our communications. We hold meetings on their planet as often as we do in space now. I am pleased by this in all honesty. There is a strange appeal to these people that was simply not there when we first met. One particularly unguarded conversation with a human diplomatic aide produced an interesting result. The young woman said that she and many others were raised in fiction involving humanity playing the defender against unexplained or meaningless alien invasion, or playing the victim of some horrible, incomprehensible force of destruction, and the thought that life beyond their own system would be friendly and share the virtue of self-sacrifice was a vast relief. I had never considered this. Most species in this galaxy, we find, are very open with us immediately, or at least after a very brief period of distrust. These people did not trust us beyond discussion until we had offered our lives to save the planet, Yet it seemed that we have achieved more in that act of proposed sacrifice than we had realised. These humans do, however, place too much emphasis on propriety for the sake of propriety. I do hope this woman does not come to reprimand because of our entirely unofficial exchange. The ambassador of the humans has certainly been making more and more of an effort to control what we see and hear of these people, the more time we spend with them. Entry 20 I understand fully now why the human ambassador was trying to restrict our communications. The ship's crew, not part of our diplomatic efforts, have been covertly compiling and translating vast amounts of the messages directed to our ship without our approval. We have been exposed to their indirect communications of course, we discover them through the presence of their first radio transmissions after all, and we have tapped their system-wide information networks, but the unauthorised communications directed to us specifically have been politely ignored and untranslated thanks almost entirely to the human ambassador's fervent pleas. The crew of the ship, however, have found that some of the signals contain messages of such hate and vitriol, such murderous rage and terrorised accusations, that had I not spent over 300 local days immersing myself in their culture, I could have mistaken it for a declaration of war. The human ambassador has much to answer for. Entry 21 the human ambassador was confronted over the messages we had received today. I asked him to meet us aboard the ship, not our own ambassador, such as to put him at ease. He met us without his various aides and diplomats, with nobody but him, his second, the ambassador, the ship's captain, and me present. We tried to tact it that I suggested myself, placing transcripts of the communications before him with no comment. He picked them up, curious, and rifled through them displaying a chemical reaction that drained much of the blood from his face. His second could stand to look at the communiques no more than he. He looked for a few pages before seemingly getting the gist, dropping them on the table and looking at us blankly. Our ambassador asked him what he had to say on behalf of the people who sent the messages, and he replied only after a few seconds of staring at the table. I wish they did not exist. Imagine the room, the three of us, sitting across from two human diplomats who looked so nervous they could have been taken for gravely ill, not one of us even saying a word. 
I do not know how long we sat like that. Finally, the ambassador asked the obvious, just to ensure no meaning was lost. The people, or the messages? The people, the ambassador replied sadly. People are so afraid of what they're unfamiliar with that they hate it. It's an instinct we should have shed by now. Entry 22 The human ambassador seemed disarmed, even resigned. Why should he not be? He had been caught in the lie of a mission. The ship's captain spoke next. Some of these people are threatening violence against the diplomats under my protection. Why should I permit that? The human ambassador's second looked rather sullen at the word permit, but did nothing. The human ambassador acted as if he had not heard. Humans are a tribal creature by nature and we did not evolve as the pinnacle predator. So we treat cultures we have not experienced and potential threats we have not faced before with great scepticism. Why do you think we suddenly allowed you to visit Earth after the incident with the asteroid? You showed a virtue we share. Willingness to sacrifice. It's easier to relate to someone who acts like you. Then why did the hateful messages not cease entirely? I asked. The human ambassador shook his head. Because, sir, the human race is a fractitious one. We do not think with one mind or share one opinion. Why do you think we still have the United Nations around? The more humans there are in a room, the more inevitable the disagreements are. He actually smiled. It's about the only thing that makes normal human diplomacy bearable. The educated mind likes nothing more than a disagreement. But these messages are not invitations to a debate, I pressed. Some are open messages of hate. And many humans are stupid, the human ambassador replied with disgust. Products of intolerant upbringing or ideology. Suppress them then, the captain said with equal disgust. Never, the human ambassador said with sudden vigour. All humans of any import agree on this. Everybody has a right to be wrong. Anyway, he said with somewhat less passion. Nothing is more attractive to the dispossessed than an officially sanctioned bad idea. Entry 23 11 lunar cycles, just over 300 local days have passed since I arrived. The humans have given up pressing for FTL drive technology completely now, seeing that it will get them nowhere. We have addressed the humans directly without a buffer of diplomats at the UN headquarters or through proxies like the Ambassador. We spoke on their interplanetary data network using their admittedly superior instantaneous broadcaster. The human ambassador has recovered quickly from the shock we gave him, much to his credit. It was, in fact, he who suggested that we address the people directly. He told us people would react best if we broke down our speech to the simplest possible elements, explaining why we made each decision. I thought that that would be interpreted as an insult, but he assured me that if there was one thing that humans resented in unison, it was having people talk as if everybody in the audience understood exactly what was going on. So we told them what the ambassador had told them directly. That we were representatives of a large confederacy of species who agreed to mutual defence in the case of extragalactic invasion, constantly invoked. Refusal of FTL drive technology to those who do not already have it, blessedly a rare concern, and integrating a new species into the galactic community, humanity was one of less than a dozen. The people of Earth were then permitted to ask questions of us directly, screened by a human diplomatic team on Earth, and sent up to us. They ranged from the banal, what's your homeworld called in English, to the probing, from what stems your desire to keep us from FTL, to the disturbing, do your people ever invade others? I wonder what use it could do, but the human ambassador seemed to think it was a success. Entry 24 only a few days left in our Earth diplomatic exchange. The ambassador of the humans seems to have taken ill. Somehow he has been more and more uncomfortable in his dealings with us, in a physical sense. At the advice of his cohort, we have taken to keeping all our meetings on Earth, so that he does not have to abide by the discomforts of the quick, but rough transit from the surface to the ship. Here he seems more familiar, if not more comfortable. He has explained to me the reason for his sudden change of topic all those days ago, after the asteroid incident. He said that he had wanted to know how our people treated its criminals, not in punishment for their crimes, but in our leniency to the excused. If someone commits a crime, for instance, but saves another's life, do we let him go? Or punish him fully? Or punish him less? 
We told them then that generally it depended on the severity of the crime, for some crimes could not be uncommitted. He explained that he had relaxed upon hearing that because it was a value we shared, though not all of the nearly 200 nations on Earth, let alone the six colonies, had justice in common. Entry 25 The ambassador worsens now, his health deteriorating. Our meetings last only a few hours, with the rest of our time spent poring over the larger and larger amounts of information his staff have been releasing to us. Information about their militaries, mostly. Knowledge regarding their capability to adapt to warfare in space. Our talk of extragalactic threats, it seems, has startled several of the species' military leaders, and they wanted to know how much they would have to change if they agreed to be part of our confederation. We took one look at their military history, and realised that they would have to retool their entire military from the ground up. Over nine-tenths of the armed forces they had available to them were tied to the ground, with most, if the remainder comprising obsolete oceanic navies and aerospace forces that couldn't seriously threaten our escape pods, much less our juggernaut-tier defender ships. One thing that was actually somewhat surprising to me was the data regarding their nuclear weapons. One file stated that at one point, one of the now-dissolved nations of their people had possessed a nuclear weapon, called Bomb of Kings, that could have produced a yield over 200 times that of the bomb that diverted that asteroid. A blast like that could have reduced our diplomatic cruiser to a fine radioactive powder. Yet it seems that all such weapons were decommissioned and turned into power plant fuel decades before our first contact. What was surprising to me was that these very warlike people could have displayed the restraint needed to make weapons such as that and not use them. There were well in excess of 24,000 nuclear weapons in humanity's history, detailed in two global arms races in two centuries. Yet only two had been used. Entry 26. 360 days have passed. The human ambassador is dying. Neither their own medical technology, nor ours, even if offered, could save him. He is suffering from a massive systematic organ failure that his staff has privately informed me to be systematic of heavy metal poisoning. I am in shock. How? Why? We've done no such thing to him. The hateful messages aimed at us from the surface have not changed in volume or content either. So who has done this? Entry 27 The human ambassador has contacted me privately from his deathbed. Not the ambassador, not the captain. Me. He has told me privately that he knew he had been poisoned when he had taken us on one of our tours of the United Nations when someone had slipped a poison in his drink. He hadn't figured it out until his doctors had told him roughly what day it had occurred, and had no idea who, specifically, was responsible. He told me to contact the ambassador and captain on his behalf and tell them, and instruct them to tell nobody else. I asked him why I was to keep it secret, and he told me that he wanted us to make a decision. He then broke the connection before I could ask him what he meant. Needless to say, I am apprehensive. The man knows he's been poisoned in the final days of the negotiations, so keeping it quiet when the culprit is unknown I can understand, but why would he distrust the rest of our crew and diplomats? Had he suspected us, he would never have told us. Entry 28 The human ambassador is perhaps the boldest being I have ever encountered in all my centuries of life. Surely he could not have planned for every single outcome of this venture. Surely he could not have predicted what we would do. Not now. After less than a year of knowing of our existence, after 40 days of crippling illness. Surely he could not. And yet, here we are. Now on the final day of the conference, he announced, live to the whole species, that he had less than a day to live. And that he knew that one of the diplomats on his trusted staff had poisoned him in the UN. He then cut the three of us into the transmission, streaming from the bridge of our ship. I can only thank goodness that we have been in front of live humans beyond the diplomatic course so infrequently, else they would have seen our shock and horror at the sudden recording. The human ambassador then went on to state that he had told the aliens, had told us, that he knew that we were innocent, and that it was time for us to make a decision. Entry 29. He said that if humanity was to become a trusted and valuable member of the galactic community, capable of upholding the responsibility of the Confederacy's laws and mutual defences, that we had to do the same. We had, he said, the means of depopulating Earth right before us, the asteroid 
Bigsby had accidentally diverted towards Earth. He smirked through the drugs and pain, and said that trust was a two-way street. We needed to be able to trust humanity, but humanity needed to trust us. And so I leave it to you, my faraway friends, he managed, to render unto us the just deserts of this betrayal. I am dead by the hand of one I trusted. You can inflict the punishment of the arbitrary, dropping an asteroid on our entire population, almost certainly killing the one responsible, and demonstrating what humanity has in excess. Or you could not, and demonstrate what I think I see in you. He cut his channel. Entry 30 There we sat, free aliens before the entire human species. I couldn't see them, but I could see their world. An entire planet. Ten billion people, with free aliens controlling them all. Every single one of our communication channels, from radio to data stream, to the instant cast relay we were using to broadcast, was active, with unheard hails from across the solar system. Free aliens, and a year of diplomacy, to decide the fate of a species. The ambassador broke our frozen state of shock. Choosing his words carefully, he spoke to the instant cast. We have just seen the closest thing to a human leader killed by one of his own aides. This reflects rather poorly on your species' ability to think ahead. You have had two periods in your history when you collected nuclear weapons in case you might have had to use them. Half of your people live in untenable squalor, the other half travel the planets. He leaned forward, obviously dreading his next words. I have read your history, steeped in blood. Your own ambassador admitted in shame the tens of thousands of communications with which we have been bombarded since we arrived represent a substantial portion of your population and their mindset. Ignorant. Fearful. Theocratic. You actually have the nerve to make war on yourselves, even as you petition for the ability to spread to other star systems and join our defence against the enemy from beyond the galaxy. He sat back, looking drained. Now, your ambassador without even so much as warning us, forces us to decide whether or not your people get to exist, or join the Confederacy even if you do. It is not, to borrow a phrase, what I signed up for. Entry 31 Then he turned to me, and his thoughts must have echoed my own, and the captain's. He looks back at the camera and grinned. Yet, the very person who just entrusted you to us clearly thought that you were worthy of us. He has spoken at length about the virtues we share, compassion for the family, sacrifice when needed, curiosity. He said that nothing we had done or said or shared could have achieved as much as our willingness to divert that asteroid did. He showed us the monuments to progress your people have made. Your people achieved powered flight less than 300 years ago, yet you have colonized six bodies in your system, two terraformed from little more than rock and methane ice, you show a drive and an adaptability we have never seen before. After less than a year of meetings, when one year ago he did not know we existed, your humanity decided that not only were you deserving of our trust, but we were deserving of yours. About your culture and mindset, I know only what I can learn in one year. And already, your ambassador chose to think that I knew enough to judge you favourably. The ambassador stood, the camera tracking him. The captain and I joined him. The ambassador faced the instant cast and spoke. He was right. Our greeting lasted as a year, humanity. So now, let me welcome you to the galaxy. Entry 32. Life has become rather hectic of late. A new human ambassador has been chosen, and the UN is busy streamlining their voting bodies to make it easier to make decisions on behalf of the species rather than opposing political ideologies. I understand that the process was eased by the discovery of the one responsible for the poisoning of our friend, the former ambassador. He died mere minutes after hearing our decision. I didn't think I would be capable of getting so personally involved in an alien diplomatic affair, but I felt emotionally drained when the diplomat responsible for slipping the poison to the ambassador was caught. Representatives from the other 28 members of the Confederacy that have attained spaceflight have arrived to officially welcome humanity into the greater galaxy, but the UN Security Council was most direct in their demands that our ambassador take point. 
The negative backlash against the decision to leave the entire species' fate up to the ambassador was disheartening to behold. I understand that entire regions of the planet nearly rose in arms over the human ambassador's choice. I am led to understand that his appointment had not been uncontested, as he was apparently very rich in his own right, and some did not think that he would represent humanity faithfully. I am glad he proved them wrong. Our own ambassador has been the subject of rather angry commentary from the human press of late. Apparently those few moments wherein he looked like he might really drop the asteroid on the planet, and alongside the litany of complaints against humans including theocratic, were enough to convince some elements of humanity that the choice had been a loaded one. More than a few people in our own staff grumble that we have been saddled with an unfair burden, now having the responsibility of leading a foreign race by example, and they are not wrong. Entry 33 Still, I can think of worse men to lead by example than one who has had centuries of experience in diplomatic patience, and made the correct choice given the opportunity to blunt such an apparently threatening species as humanity. As for myself, I have tabled the recommendation that we use one of our freighters to drag the largest asteroid we can to the orbit of Earth, and have it be used to create another of their space platforms, and use that, a truly neutral ground, as the base of operations for further participation in the Confederacy. Certainly the easily preventable death of their previous ambassador helped convince the new one of the idea's merit. The galaxy is a convoluted place, and the diplomatic tactics embraced by the humans since we met them, poisoning, ultimatums, etc., whether these are the normal or not will not be greeted with anything even remotely approaching enthusiasm by the rest of the galaxy. But I am confident that, in time, the rest of the Confederacy shall see as we do, that humanity has a place among equals in the defence and enrichment of the space-faring people. End journal.